Stripping away the popular image of serene, silver-bearded wisdom, I'll reveal the disturbed childhood, the lawless youth, the lifelong feuds, and the guilty secrets Dumbledore carried to his grave. Why was the man tipped to be Minister of Magic content to remain a mere headmaster? Is what Rita Skeeter's The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore would be about. But unlike Skeeter, we're going to take a look at the actual history of the beloved Hogwarts headmaster. So join me as we look at the full history of Dumbledore! If you enjoy HP and want more after this video, check out our videos on Grindelwald and proud Hufflepuff Newt Scamander. While Dumbledore is most known to us through his hobby of 10-pin bowling and his affection for chamber music, I didn't realize bowling was a popular wizard pastime, but then I am just a mere muggle. Let's start from the very beginning. Also, as a note, I will be talking about Crimes of Grindelwald spoilers near the end of the video, but I'll let you know when I get to them. We know thanks to Pottermore, Albus Dumbledore was born in 1881. He was the son of Percival and Kendra Dumbledore and had two siblings, a younger brother named Aberforth and a younger sister named Ariana. They were all born in the mostly wizarding village of Mold on the Wald. However, it was early on that tragedy would strike the Dumbledore family. While Mold on the Wald was a popular wizarding village, it was still a village where wizards lived in hiding amongst muggles. When Albus was just a young boy, a group of muggle boys witnessed the even younger Ariana, who was six, accidentally performing magic. They tried to get her to do it again, and she couldn't, so instead they beat her up. As you do, apparently. This traumatized Ariana to a point where she refused to use magic, but it built up inside of her, exploding at random points and making her massively dangerous when it happened. Albus's father, Percival, flipped out about this and attacked the children who had traumatized his daughter. For doing so, he was sentenced to prison in Azkaban. While the whole family could reveal the truth of the situation, which might have prevented this prison sentence, they chose to stay silent in order to protect Ariana, who would have been sent to St. Mungo's Hospital. Shortly after this tragedy, Kendra Dumbledore, who is now solely in charge of the family, moved everyone to Godric's Hollow, the same wizarding town Harry Potter would eventually be born in. Albus was then sent to Hogwarts, where nasty rumors about his father spread and haunted him, with him becoming known as the son of a muggle hater. However, in spite of this, Dumbledore's brilliance allowed him to overcome his familial obstacles. He was both a genius and kind, and teachers and students quickly took notice. During his first day at Hogwarts, Dumbledore met Elpheus Doge, who had greenish skin and pox marks due to contracting dragon pox, which sounds like the worst first day of school you could ever have. However, Albus still befriended Doge immediately while many had been avoiding him, and according to Doge, by the end of their first year, Albus had already started to become known as the most brilliant student to have ever attended Hogwarts. He helped teach his friends and began corresponding with other famous wizards of the time, such as Nicholas Flamel, creator of the Philosopher's Stone, who, as a side note, was based on the real-life Nicholas Flamel, whom this is a picture of. Real-life Nicholas Flamel was a scribe who, somehow, hundreds of years after his death became associated with alchemy and created a philosopher's stone that could turn metal into gold, as well as drinking an elixir of life for immortality. So smash both of those together and you had the Harry Potter version of the Philosopher's Stone. He also corresponded with Batilda Bagshot, a famous wizarding historian, and Adalbert Waffling, a magical theoretician behind the theory of waffles and pancakes. And I made none of that up. Dumbledore won every single notable prize Hogwarts offered and became a prefect his fifth year, then a head boy his seventh. While he was in school, papers he wrote for assignments were published in the likes of Transfiguration Today, Challenges in Charming, and The Practical Potioneer. Apparently, he absolutely obliterated his nude exams, as Gracilda Marchbanks, who oversaw Dumbledore in Transfiguration and Charms, commented he'd, quote, done things with a wand she'd never seen before. <laughs> I'm trying so hard not to make the obvious joke here. You, uh, sure he's gay, J.K. Rowling? After Hogwarts, the world was Albus Dumbledore's oyster. Albus and Elpheus Doge planned to tour the world together and meet foreign wizards before pursuing their career. As Dumbledore himself admits to Harry, he wanted glory and wanted to shine. However, another family tragedy was soon to strike. Right when Albus and Doge were about to leave on their trip, Albus' mother, Kendra Dumbledore, died. As the new head of the household, and with the difficult circumstance concerning his sister Ariana, Albus returned home bitter and resentful, feeling like his talents were going to waste. 
And it was at this point another major event would happen in his life, Gellert Grindelwald. Will we die just a little? Not that Grindelwald. We'll get the Fantastic Bees later. According to The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore, which despite being written by Rita Skeeter, does have nuggets of truth in it, after being expelled from Durmstrang, Grindelwald ended up in Godric Hollow, where his aunt, Batilda Bagshot, introduced him to Albus. Grindelwald discussed his ideals for a new wizarding world with Dumbledore, one where wizards wouldn't have to live in hiding from muggles, and one where wizards would rule over muggles. He also shared his obsession with the Deathly Hallows, and Dumbledore became infatuated with both of these obsessions. According to J.K. Rowling, after the books were published, Albus Dumbledore was gay and romantically interested in Grindelwald, so it's definitely possible that his romantic interest blindsided him to the darkness of Gellert's plans. Dumbledore states, Did I know in my heart of hearts what Gellert Grindelwald was? I think I did, but I closed my eyes. He tried to assuage his conscience with empty words and fought to put down his various scruples. Eventually, he wrote a letter to Grindelwald. Gellert, your point about wizard dominance being for the muggle's own good, this, I think, is the crucial point. Yes, we have been given power, and yes, the power gives us the right to rule, but it also gives us responsibilities over the ruled. We must stress this point. It will be the foundation stone upon which we build. Where we are posed, as we surely will be, this must be the basis of all of our counter-arguments. We seize control for the greater good. This phrase, for the greater good, would be taken by Grindelwald for his eventual campaign. While this was all a certain low light in Albus' life, it only lasted a couple months and would all come to an abrupt end. Albus and Grindelwald schemed to travel the world in search for the Deathly Hallows and to start their plans of wizard domination, and Aberforth found out about this. He protested knowing Ariana would get dragged along, sparking an argument and an altercation. Gellert, Aberforth, and Albus all fought in a three-way wizarding duel, slinging curses at one another, and some way or another, Ariana was hit by one of these curses and killed. While neither Aberforth nor Albus knew who flung the curse that caused this, knowing it may have been himself, Albus was stricken with guilt and grief. Grindelwald fled from the scene to avoid blame and getting in trouble for what happened, and through this tragedy, Albus returned to his senses and became better for it. Sometime after this, Albus decided to teach at Hogwarts. I'm not sure exactly when, as he was credited with discovering the 12 uses of dragon's blood, which has also been somewhat contested by Rita Skeeter, meaning the contesting it probably is a load of bull, so this may have been after or before. He was offered the job of Minister of Magic, but having seen his own dark side and what power did to him, decided to decline the offer. At Hogwarts, Dumbledore taught Defense of the Dark Arts and eventually Transfiguration. By the 1930s, Dumbledore had also begun recruiting students for Hogwarts. In 1938, he visited Wolves' Orphanage, where he would find a peculiar young boy, one who was charming, but Dumbledore immediately noticed had certain instincts for cruelty, secrecy, and domination. This boy was Tom Riddle, whom the Wizarding World would learn to fear as Voldemort. While Tom Riddle attended Hogwarts, Dumbledore would be the only one to watch him and see through his obvious charms. Tom Riddle gained entrance to the Chamber of Secrets and unleashed the Basilisk, which ended up killing Myrtle Warren, better known as Moaning Myrtle. While Riddle was able to successfully frame Hagrid and his pet Acromantula, Aragog, getting Hagrid expelled, Dumbledore was the only one to see through his lies and suspect it was in fact Riddle who was behind the death. In 1945, Dumbledore would become entangled with Grindelwald again. Grindelwald was raising an army, and Dumbledore stayed clear away in fear of Grindelwald, mostly out of the fear that Grindelwald would reveal to Dumbledore who had killed Ariana on that fateful day, and it might have been Albus himself. However, as Geller continued to grow in power and followers, there came a point where too many people were dying and Grindelwald seemed unstoppable. Finally, Dumbledore stepped up, dueled with Grindelwald, and won the duel. Grindelwald had stolen the Elder Wand, and by winning the duel, now Albus had procured for himself the Elder Wand. Which also shows you just how tremendously powerful of a wizard Dumbledore was if he could stop the dangerous and powerful wizard like Grindelwald who was using the Elder Wand against him. This would live on to be considered one of Dumbledore's greatest achievements, with it even being mentioned on Albus's chocolate frog card. Dumbledore is particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945. Come on. 
Once again, while teaching at Hogwarts, Dumbledore was frequently offered the position of Minister of Magic, which he regularly turned down. Eventually, sometime shortly after 1965, Aldous Dumbledore was appointed Headmaster of Hogwarts. Around this point, Tom Riddle, now known as Lord Voldemort, returned to Hogwarts to ask Dumbledore for a position as a teacher in defense of the dark arts. Dumbledore turned Voldemort down, who was furious. When Remus Lupin, who had already been bitten by a werewolf, tried to attend Hogwarts, he was relieved to find Dumbledore sympathetic to his plight. Dumbledore made both the Shrieking Shack and Whopping Willow to guard it, so Remus could hide there during his transformations. It's also through Lupin we know the vague vicinity of when Dumbledore became headmaster, as he finally recalls it was sometime shortly after he was bit as a child that Dumbledore was given the prestigious title. When Lord Voldemort truly rose to power and prominence in 1970, Dumbledore took a quick stand against him creating the Order of the Phoenix, a secret organization for those who would stand up to the Death Eaters and Voldemort. It was around this time Dumbledore would be involved in what would come to cause all of the major events of the Harry Potter books. Albus was interviewing Sybil Trelawney for the position of divination professor at Hogwarts. Right when he had concluded she was a fraud, Sybil fell into a trance and spouted out an actual prophecy. A prophecy about the end of Voldemort. She prophesied someone with the power to defeat Voldemort would be born on the last day of July. Severus Snape overheard this prophecy and escaped to tell his master Lord Voldemort. Meanwhile, Dumbledore gave Trelawney the position at Hogwarts in order to keep her safe from Voldemort. As it so happens, Harry Potter and Neville Longbottom were both born on this date, and Lord Voldemort decided on Harry being the one from the prophecy. Snape found out about this, and as he was in love with Lily Potter his entire life, he betrayed Voldemort and approached Dumbledore about protecting Lily Potter and her son. Dumbledore instructed the Potters to hide in their house and protect it with the Fidelius charm. While he and everyone around them believed Sirius Black was the secret keeper, this was switched at the last minute to Peter Pettigrew in order to throw off Lord Voldemort. While the Potters hid, Dumbledore acquired the invisibility cloak from them which he wanted to inspect, as he was still interested in the Deathly Hallows. As fate would have it, Peter Pettigrew betrayed the Potters for Lord Voldemort, and as we all know, Harry Potter would become the boy who lived. At this point, I'm not going to talk about everything Dumbledore has done throughout the Harry Potter books, as it's both a lot and it's pretty common knowledge if you read the books, but I do want to highlight some of the important points. After Harry's parents died, Dumbledore had him sent to live with his relatives, the Dursleys, unaware of their extreme prejudice against wizards. He was, however, aware that Voldemort may still somehow be living on, and was, at the very least, able to keep Harry safe by having him live with the Dursleys, casting charms so Voldemort couldn't hurt him while he lived with blood relatives. Dumbledore also hired Severus Snape to work at Hogwarts. While Snape wanted a position in defense of the dark arts, Dumbledore refused and kept him as the potions master, which probably was a better call anyways, as Snape was somewhat of a genius in potions. While Voldemort attempted to come back to life with the Philosopher's Stone, it was specifically the events of the second Harry Potter book and the Chamber of Secrets which truly tipped Dumbledore off to Voldemort's horcruxes. Dumbledore became highly suspicious of Tom Riddle's diary, not only that it was itself a horcrux, but that Voldemort had created more. Things came to a head once again when in Harry's fourth year, Harry was transported to a graveyard at the end of the Triwizard Tournament and his blood was used to bring Lord Voldemort back to life. While Cornelius Fudge and the Ministry of Magic refused to believe this, Dumbledore did, once again preparing the Order of the Phoenix to fight Voldemort. Out of fear and not wanting to hear the truth, Dumbledore suffered severe political consequences for stating Voldemort had returned. He was voted out of the International Confederation of Wizards and was demoted from Chief Warlock of the Wizengamot. Of course, Dumbledore, who always had a good-natured humor to him, at least in his old age, commented he didn't care as long as he was still one of the chocolate frog cards. Near the end of Harry Potter's fifth year, the wizarding world was forced to accept the truth when Cornelius Fudge himself witnessed Voldemort's return. Harry Potter and members of Dumbledore's army had fallen for a trap laid out by Voldemort and the Death Eaters in the Ministry of Magic. Fortunately, Snape tipped off the Order of the Phoenix, and while members arrived to help out, Dumbledore himself arrived at the Ministry to fight off the Death Eaters, save everyone, and duel with Voldemort, who ended up needing to flee. The summer after this, Dumbledore went in search of Voldemort's remaining Horcruxes. He was able to find Marvel Gaunt's ring, another of the Horcruxes, which contained the final Deathly Hallow, the Resurrection Stone. Dumbledore's grief and desire to see his family again was overbearing, and he abandoned all caution trying on the ring. 
The ring immediately cursed him, and with the help of Snape, Dumbledore was able to briefly contain the curse to his hand. While he managed to destroy the Horcrux, the curse was slowly spreading throughout his body and would kill him within around a year's time. Dumbledore requested Snape kill him when the time came, as he was dying anyways, and he learned Voldemort had instructed Draco Malfoy to kill him. He wanted to save Malfoy from being tarnished, losing his innocence, and becoming truly evil. Reluctantly, Snape agreed. Finally, Dumbledore passed on clues and information to Harry Potter about the Horcruxes in order to pass on the duty and ensure Voldemort was stopped once and for all. He had also figured out Harry was a Horcrux and hoped to instill the virtue in Harry to allow Harry to think he was giving up his life in self-sacrifice. In June 1997, Dumbledore allowed Harry to accompany him in finding and destroying one of these Horcruxes, Slytherin's Locket. The event weakened Dumbledore, and the two survived the nightmare of an event involving Inferi and Harry being forced to put poison down Dumbledore's throat, only to arrive at a Hogwarts that had been penetrated by Death Eaters thanks to the efforts of Draco Malfoy. Dumbledore immediately cast a full body bind curse on Harry, so Harry couldn't help out or intervene. While Draco disarmed Dumbledore of his wand, unknowingly becoming the owner of the Elder Wand, Dumbledore pleaded with Snape who was soon to arrive to finish himself off. Snape obeyed, killing Dumbledore and sparing Malfoy of the duty, all while playing double agent against the Death Eaters and convincing Harry Snape was a murderous liar. Dumbledore's fight against Voldemort wouldn't end here. Knowing he was soon to die, he left Harry, Hermione, and Ron items in his will that would make it past the Ministry of Magic and serve as major clues for them in finding and destroying the final Horcruxes. And throughout all of this, it's really Dumbledore's good nature and humor that makes him so likable. He always stood up for what was right, and even in the face of insurmountable danger, he always remained lighthearted. So all of that said, let's talk Fantastic Beasts. So if you haven't seen these movies, and in particular, The Crimes of Grindelwald, there will be spoilers. According to The Crimes of Grindelwald, which was written by J.K. Rowling, I actually think that's important to note here. It turns out Albus Dumbledore has another brother. That's right, it's Credence Barebone, the orphan from the first Fantastic Beast film whose repressed magic turned him into an obscurial. I don't know how you didn't see that coming. So, allegedly, according to Grindelwald, during a voyage to America in 1901, Credence was a baby born to the Dumbledore family and switched in the crib with a different baby, then given up to an orphanage. And Credence's actual name is Aurelius Dumbledore. And yes, I realize that the date I gave you is 1901, and Dumbledore was born in 1881, meaning that according to both the books and Harry Potter canon, Dumbledore would have been 20 years old, his father in prison, and his mother dead. So, either this makes zero sense, or is a lie Grindelwald is telling. Because seriously, it makes zero sense. Right, so also according to the crimes of Grindelwald, Dumbledore and Grindelwald swore a blood pact against fighting each other, and now the reason he can't fight Grindelwald is because of the blood pact the two swore as kids. Which I guess had have happened after Albus Aberforth and Grindelwald dueled each other. Even though that doesn't really make sense either, because I'm pretty sure Albus wouldn't have been down to make a blood pact after that point. I mean, look, it's showcased before, but that just doesn't make sense given the fact they all dueled each other. Anyways, that means that while Dumbledore can't fight Grindelwald, who's now protected from him, Grindelwald also can't stop Dumbledore from standing up to him. So this is why Grindelwald wants to recruit Credence the Obscurial in order to kill Dumbledore. Which I guess gives credit to the theory that Grindelwald is lying to Credence about being related to the Dumbledores in order to make Credence really mad and then try to kill Albus. Beyond Fantastic Beasts, we also see what Dumbledore and Hogwarts were like from 1984 to 1991, before Harry arrived, in the mobile game Harry Potter Hogwarts Mystery. So that wraps up the history of Albus Dumbledore. What are some of your favorite quotes and moments from Albus Dumbledore? My personal favorite is him musing that death is but the next great adventure, which is a pretty reassuring thought. But let us know what you think in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time. Peace.